cardiogenic shock. So it usually occurs when there's, we talk about cardiogenic shock, when we're talking about an impaired contractility of the heart. And that's when there's something going on that's blocking the heart from contracting or the muscles from working the proper way. Um, one of the common way, things that causes this is ST elevation, myocardial infarction. So you have a big infarct, there's loss of blood flow and the muscles don't work. If you have a valvular rupture, so one of the full valves doesn't work. If there's some sort of arrhythmia or under underlying arrhythmia where it's not contracting because the electrical aspect of the heart is just firing too rapidly or too slowly, and it doesn't allow for that contraction to occur. Um, or in somebody with the chronic congestive heart failure that should be on medications or has been on medications that isn't taking those medications the way they're supposed to. Kind of still, this is what I was talking about with the shock and still falling, falling into this cardiogenic shock because it has to do with the heart and the physiology of the heart is this obstructive shock. Um, and obstructive shock is similar in pathophysiology and it really acts similar to how cardiogenic shock, it kind of is interchangeable or synonymous with it. But in these, when we say obstructive shock, this tends to be something more from say a pulmonary embolism. So it's causing obstruction of those pulmonary um, vessels. So not allowing the contraction or cardiac tamponade, something's obstructing the contraction, a pneumothorax in the lungs that is so large that it's pressing up against the heart or a congenital malformation. So more pediatric type of this obstructive, but also cardiogenic shock since it's originating from the heart and the function of the heart isn't working properly to allow blood flow for that perfusion and therefore shock occurs. So when we look at these patients, our bedside evaluation is so important. And, you know, sometimes they can give us information and, you know, information, some of the times these are patients that you've seen multiple times in your ER that just, you know, tends to be the nature of people with heart failure or have cardiac disease. Um, but they, your bedside evaluation is going to give you a lot of information. So when we're talking about cardiogenic shock, they're, they're in shock, they're hypotensive, their blood pressure is low. These patients can present to you normotensive or even hypertensive and then decompensate while you're taking care of them. So that's important to note. They are typically tachycardic. So with cardiogenic shock, we often see patients are tachycardic. Sometimes that tachycardia is blunted. That can be because of medications that people are on. So if somebody has a longstanding heart failure and they're on a, medic a rate controlling medication, they might not mount that tachycardia also in extremes of age. So like an elderly person may not have that same physiological ability to become tachycardic when their body needs them to compensate for that low blood pressure. Um, and when you're, and then also when you're evaluating them, you're, when you're looking at their extremities, they're typically cold. And that's because your your the vessels in this physiology are going to constrict and they have that big vasoconstriction to shunt blood to the important parts to get the blood back from the extremities back up to the heart. And so you'll see that they're cool to the touch. A lot of times they have peripheral edema because of their longstanding heart disease or even the acute process. Ultrasound is really valuable in patients with cardiogenic shock. So like we talked about last week, that rush exam for undifferentiated shock patients can give you valuable information. Um, and a bedside echo, depending on your skill set, is really helpful if you don't have formal echo and you can get great information for cardiac enlargement, beelines, pericardial fluid. And then we'll talk about it, but it's also really great when you're looking at the IBC, should you be giving them fluid? Because these are patients where you have to be really careful with how much fluid you're administrating because administering, you can make it worse um, as opposed to sepsis where you're usually more okay to just keep giving fluid. So just as a, you know, showing this chart we looked at last week with your rush exam or even on the echo, really, the highlight is just the pump function of the heart is going to be uh, hypocontractile 
you're going to have dilated heart oftentimes. You can look at your IVC and note that it's distended. So they're, even though they're hypotensive, they don't need fluids. Um, they can have distended jugular veins. And then you can also sometimes look for the fluid in the lungs, look for those B lines and, and other valuable aspects with that rush exam. Um, going into looking at their labs and imaging, so kind of basic labs, a CBC, CMP, troponin, all valuable in these patients, looking for other signs of other signs of shock, so the hemoglobin, looking at their electrolytes, because in these patients where they have abnormal function of the cardiac muscle, it's a, always great to optimize your electrolytes. Sometimes that helps the, the heart muscles function better. BMP, um, it's pretty sensitive. It's not specific, meaning it can be elevated for numerous things. It can be chronically elevated in a lot of patients, but it's sensitive. So if it's over a thousand, I mean, it makes the likelihood of having acute CHF as the cause of your shock or the cause of what's going on pretty likely, or at least you have some contributing factor for the heart. EKG, really valuable in this because you can try to look for the etiology of your cardiogenic shock. So ST elevation of my eyes, um, any signs of recent infarct. If you have pericardial tamponades, you're going to get that um, alternating current arrhythmias, ventricular dysfunction, so left bundle branch hypertrophy, all the things, because you all know how to interpret EKGs, I'm sure. And, you know, that's just a great tool in this case is for imaging, chest x-ray is really the, the main one. Again, looking at the lungs, you can look for an enlarged heart silhouette but it can, that's usually a more chronic thing. It's pretty rare for you to have acute changes um, with the heart on x-ray. And then a CTA, if you're worried about one of those obstructive disease processes, so you can look for cardiac tamponade. You can see that slightly on a CTA. And then of course the pulmonary embolism. So the big thing for this is shock. So with these people and like sepsis and why these can, it's good to be able to differentiate early is because you don't want to give too much fluid in somebody because their heart is just not going to be able to handle the fluid. You can give them fluid and it's just going to make them fluid overloaded. They're just going to, that fluid's going to leak into the extravascular spaces because their heart doesn't have the ability to take that fluid in, pump it and get it to where it actually needs to go. Um, a great way to see if you're dealing with somebody that is in cardiogenic shock that just is purely fluid overloaded, or if they do need a little fluid, and that's part of why they're hypotensive is a, a short fluid bolus challenge or a small bullet bolus. And um, 250 is usually what's recommended. So you can use ultrasound, you can give 250 milliliters of just IV fluids and look at the IVC or the inferior vena cava and see if it's still collapsing or if it looks like it's large. Um, another trick that you can do, like if you don't have an IV or you're waiting or you just don't want to give the fluid, you really think they're fluid overloaded is you can actually just lift the patient's legs up and then look at the IVC because there's the amount of fluid that's, that would be moved from the legs or the lower extremities into the heart with just lifting their legs up is pretty equivalent to 250 mLs. And so you basically just give them a fluid challenge that way without actually giving them fluid. So if you're really thinking they don't need it, then you can just do that. They need. So in these patients, they're going to need pressors and they might need them earlier than you're used to giving with say sepsis or other disease processes where you have some time and that's okay. Typically norepinephrine, like most things is the, you know, and kind of all the types of shock, but norepinephrine is the first line drug. Um, you can give, I put the dosing in on this one just so you can see it. Um, that is mostly going to act in vasoconstriction. So it constricts the vessels in the periphery, gets that blood back up to the heart, so that the heart can utilize that blood, pump it out to the other areas. You can also use epinephrine. So epinephrine is nice because it gives vasoconstriction and it will improve the contractility of the heart. 
But do remember that epinephrine will increase the patient's heart rate. So you have to be cautious with epinephrine in older individuals or people that are already tachycardic. And then dobutamine, which it was traditionally given for cardiogenic shock and for when you thought that the origin of the of the shock was cardiac in nature because of how it, it, where it acts and where the receptors are. But it, it's a tricky one because you have to be careful with dosing because at low doses, it's really not going to do great. So you need a little bit of a higher dose. The other thing with dobutamine is it doesn't function that well on the heart if the MAP is under 65. So I have seen people use it where you'll use norepinephrine and then you use the dobutamine as their second line medication for cardiogenic shock. So as opposed to other types of shock where they maybe go for uh, vasopressin or something else as their second line, once they've kind of maxed out on norepinephrine, it's nice to go norepinephrine into the dobutamine to really help with that contractility of the heart. Then you can go for more advanced things. You can get a balloon pump, an LVAD, or ECMO. And you guys will have to tell me, do you guys use ECMO at all at your facilities? Is that something you do? Um, so this is this will be my first experience working at a hospital, actually, that does ECMO at the University of Utah. So I haven't worked with it too much myself either. Um, and, but in these cardiogenic shock patients, it's kind of a nice thing to know that you have and the ability to do ECMO. Like everything else you've got to figure though, your best bet for this treatment of this is figuring out what's causing it. And then also as a, as you're working and trying to treat the shock, you're going to also work at treating the underlying causes. So in decompensated heart failure, if you think that's what's causing this cardiogenic shock, you know, you want to have some after load reduction. Typically in our heart failure patients, we expect we see them as hypertensive, more likely or normotensive. And we can give high doses of nitroglycerin, which is the best after load reducer. Well, when patients are hypotensive, that becomes tricky. There is some benefit to using some doing after load reduction with a presser. So if you have somebody that is in full blown heart failure and they are hypotensive, but you know they're in heart failure, they have pulmonary edema, they have peripheral edema, they have a long history of it. You can put them on some norepinephrine and then do a little nitroglycerin as well. The nitroglycerin can help excrete some of that fluid, can help decrease the afterload and might help your blood pressure in the long run. It does obviously lower the blood pressure, so this is a tricky game that you have to play if you're going to use both agents at the same time. Um, you can also use ACE inhibitors, but again, that's, you're likely not going to use an ACE inhibitor in somebody that is hypotensive, or at least I have never done it that way. Um, and then after the afterload reduction, you want to reduce a preload that is going to come with diuretics, but it's kind of the same as these other things. If your patient's hypotensive, probably going to wait on the diuretics and then treating all the electrolyte abnormalities, making sure a patient doesn't need blood products or anything else that you can do to help with their treatment. If the patient has this acute pulmonary edema, in addition to everything else, a, a BiPAP or CPAP is a great tool as well. And that can sometimes help their blood pressure. If you get somebody on BiPAP um, it gets some of the fluid out of their lungs. It improves the heart's ability to contract and fun function, getting blood flowing and your blood pressure up. For those other thing, you know, other causes and causes we see frequently of cardiogenic shock, you're really going to have a hard time just getting the patient better unless you treat the cause. So in an ST elevation MI, they got to get to the cath lab or get a cardiac catheterization. Um, if you have a valvular rupture, they're going to need surgery. If somebody is in cardiogenic shock from a pulmonary embolism, like a large PE, you can give heparin, but if they're at the point where they're in cardiogenic shock, they might end up needing TPA to break up that clot. And, and if you have it, a surgical embolectomy, if you have that ability to get that done. <clears throat> 
um, for cardiac tamponade. If somebody comes in there in cardiogenic shock and they're hypotensive, they're really sick, that is a person that would need a, a bedside or a quick pericardiosynthesis, and eventually a, they would have to get that fixed surgically. And then a pneumothorax needle decompression or chest tube will ho hopefully help your cardiogenic shock, and that one is a rapid improvement at the least. So that kind of sums up the lecture part. Does anybody have any questions? I'll stop here. Then we can talk about these questions that I that we have for this week. I guess that will say no. So we'll move on to the first question. And then if you guys want to answer like last yeah. week in the chat. Uh, then in, uh, uh, in Vietnam and- uh, Yeah. And in Vietnam, in our department, University Medical Center, I receive I receive many patients with uh, uh, acute uh, uh, acute uh, with uh, uh, with heart failure and mm -hmm. uh, pneumonia. Since pneumonia is one of the most Im important uh, factors that uh, puts the patient die when the patient have uh, Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Like, I mean, and a, a lot of many same time are diseases at the same time. And a lot of times with shock and, and one thing that's hard to say, oh, cardiogenic shock, septic shock, See. putting them in to separate. Heart function is not good because of their underlying medical problems and what they're because they develop this pneumonia. And, you know, it's really hard to tell in a lot of these patients, are you saying, oh, well, because they're all going to be tachycardic, they're all going to be hypotensive and they're, you know, you're looking at their pulses or their extremities and it's hard to differentiate somebody cool to the touch or warm to the touch or, you know, so what we do is not as easy as it is in a question. Obviously it's much harder and we do so many more things than any question is ever going to be able to address. We usually act on multiple things at once. Um, we're treating everything at once. We're seeing multiple disease processes at once. And so that's just kind of the nature of answering, asking questions, especially in a multiple choice form. And I agree at pneumonia is, is huge. I, I think in this one, they're just like, Thing. thing and why all the patients are dying not just in our emergency department but at home or on everywhere and they are saying the progressive hemodynamic instability is just over time and you know bouts of pneumonia or medication for medication compliance, lots of other things can lead to mortality. It leads to this hemodynamic decline um, followed by dysrhythmia. So somebody going into VTAC and dying and we don't see all, all these patients. A lot of times they never even come in because they're dead before they get to the emergency department or they die at home. Um, and then they, the when I was going through this question, something that I thought was interesting that they were talking about in the answer portion was that the short-term dysrhythmia deaths have declined quite a bit since they've been more regularly putting AICDs into patients with, um, with poor uh, cardiac output. So in the U.S., at least if somebody's cardiac output is less than 30%, then they usually consider them for getting an AICD or a defibrillator, an inter internal defibrillator placed in their chest and that has helped a lot with the deaths in the short term but they will they do usually still succumb to 
underlying illness. And then fluid overload death has declined with the use of ACE inhibitors and beta blockers. And question two, 63 year old female with a history of congestive heart failure presents for evaluation of shortness of breath. Her vital signs are pulse of 115, blood pressure of 190 over 100, respiratory rate of 28, a SAO2 of 82% on room air. Physical reveals diffuse rails. Which of the following is true? Patients in CHF presenting with severe hypertension have a higher mortality rate than normotensive or hypotensive patients. Furosemide or Lasix is the initial treatment of choice. The patient should undergo rapid sequence intubation and mechanization. An intravenous nitrate infusion should be started or non-invasive ventilation is contraindicated in the setting of severe hypertension. Uh, we choose B, yeah, we choose B, because uh, uh, blood pressure is so high and physical examination are really well uh, diffused well, so we choose B for semi. And after that, we uh, uh, evaluate patient. Uh, 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 if uh, no, the patient uh, still have uh, uh, diffuse rel, we uh, mm -hmm. give more uh, more furosemide and intravenous nitrous infusion, and supply oxygen for the patient quickly. Yes, I I agree with all of what you're saying. I think the initial they. In the question for this question, the answer is on Rosh review and their initial, they want you to give intravenous nitrate first, but I agree you would give this at the same time. This is kind of one of those questions. It was hard question. That's why I put it because you give the intravenous nitrate. So you want to first do the afterload reduction and then work on preload. But in reality, you're doing them at the same time. The This patient needs to get rid of that fluid and the rails in the lungs indicates that there is some pulmonary edema. So you'd want to get rid of that fluid by administering the furosemide, getting the Lasix in the patient. So you do it at the same time. The nitrite is going to help with getting your afterload reduced. So it's going to allow, so kind of what I put here, um, normal or decreased blood pressure have they're going to have a typically a, have systolic dysfunction, which is harder to treat, which we talked about in the lecture. Um, oh, see, I was just reading what Dr. Fuller wrote, but yeah, and a higher mortality. But this patient is going to get a diuretic, like, and but it's not needed immediately. Immediately, the nitrate, the nitrate is going to be able to work easier. And would very, very much benefit from a CPAP or a BiPAP so that they can open up. It'll help. Uh, next. next. So those are the inotropes. The other 
pure in inotrope on here is dobutamine, but also dopamine is one that's an inotrope. And then epinephrine and suggest do the vasoconstriction or is a vasopressor. And the epinephrine does both. And I put that in there just as a reminder. So if you're in a situation where say your patient is in cardiogenic shock and they're bradycardic, that's their disease process. You can try this epinephrine as something that would work to do both things and kind of be in your pocket or bag of tools to help you. And last, well, I don't know. If the, I think that, yeah, next question. A 45 year old male is discharged hospital five days ago for ST elevation myocardial infarction. He presented to the emergency department with acute onset shortness of breath for one hour. Physical exam reveals a new cholecystolic murmur heard best at the apex. His blood pressure is 156 over 98. Pulse is 128. Respiratory rate of 28. O2 of 92% on room air. EKG shows deep Q waves in V1 and V2. Chest x-ray is shown. Which of the following is the most appropriate next step in this patient's condition? This is a hard question. And especially because I'm sure for you guys, this is hard for me and I speak English as my first language. And so if you are trying to figure out what afterload means and preload reduction means, and those you know, are really tough. So the best way to move forward on this is to, to say, can you guys see, so that chest x-ray, so looking at the chest x-ray, it looks like, so we can kind of work through this there. Look, looking at the chest x-ray, it looks like there's some peripheral edema. He had an, he yeah. had a STEMI. So a complication of a, st a STEMI or an ST elevation MI in this patient with Peripheral, like, so he has pulmonary edema with the rails, he's hypertensive, his heart rate is high, and he has this new murmur. He like This patient is likely suffering from severe mitral regurgitation. Yes. As a complication from complication. his heart attack. So he probably has a, a bad mitral regurgitation. So when somebody has mitral regurgitation and they're fluid overloaded like this, the blood pressure is a little high, pulse rate is high. We want to think about how we can treat them. And the answer is going to be A, the afterload reduction. When we say afterload reduction, kind of what we want to do with that is they need surgery. That's the best thing. But in the immediate, we can medically reduce their afterload, meaning how much fluid is in their heart after the heart contracts is by giving vasodilators. So you can give nitroglycerin in this patient and it's gonna reduce the afterload. You allow the vasodilation, the vasodilation so the blood can flow more easily out of the heart. So after it contracts, there's gonna be less, there'll be less blood flow. So it's just optimizing how the heart is functioning. So in a patient with mitral, I mean, the basics of this is the patient that has mitral regurgitation, you can improve their heart function by giving them nitroglycerin. So giving them something that's going to cause profuse vasodilation and allow blood to flow mo more freely out of the heart. Does that make sense? It's a, it was a hard question and it can be tricky finding questions on just cardiogenic shock, honestly. And so, oh, the, you know, they're not all the best questions, but they help us they're really just here to help us think about what we're talking about and all learn together because this is good. This one was good review for me and, and I'm learning as well and refreshing everything. And this one is the last question. 60 year old man with a history of chronic heart failure, diabetes, and hypertension presents to the ED with a fever and productive cough. Vital signs are blood pressure, 80 over 40, heart rate of 110, respiratory rate of 18, um, temp of 38.4, and a pulse ox of 94% on room air. You note know, rails in the right lower lung field on exam. 
Chest radiograph shows right, middle, and lower lobe infiltrates. After a two liter crystalloid bolus, he remains hypotensive with a mean arterial pressure less than 65 millimeters Hg. Bedside long access inferior vena cava ultrasound is performed during inspiration and is seen here. So there's the ultrasound. Mm, I'll go back to this. Okay. What is the most appropriate next step in management? Okay. Um, initiate dopamine drip, initiate a norepinephrine drip, initiate a phenylephrine drip, initiate another bolus of crystalloid fluids. Okay, I think the patient gets the septic shock, uh, pneumonia, and uh, the vena cover is... Uh, this more fluid. This more fluid. fluid. So we choose the, uh, we choose the plus more crystalloid fluid. Yeah, look at the second line that he's gotten, the two liter crystalloid fluid bolus. He does probably need more fluids, but he got, he's gotten two liters of fluids. And he's still hypotensive. So if somebody is still hypotensive after after you've given ample amounts of fluid, think about what your next step would be. Yeah. I agree, Dr. Fuller. And yep, you guys are right. <laughs> it is both. And it is, but it's fluid. The IBC was still collapsible. And I even almost forgot on that one, but you're right. The IBC is still collapsible. This patient needs more fluid. They still might need some norepinephrine. They've gotten, um, they've gotten their two liters. So they've gotten a, a lot. You could start them on norepinephrine, but you really just, they need another fluid bolus. I threw this one in here because we see you know, we are going to see septic patients. And it was just a reminder from last week um, that I wanted you to be just always think you're going to be got to think about all different types of shock. So not just the one that we're talking about during, uh, not just the one that we're, I, sorry, I saw that he said, is he overweight? Probably overweight. Yes. Um, not just what we're talking about, because the reality of an emergency department is you, you don't get to have a question and know what, it is and septic shock is still more common and and there you go so these are the <laughs> patient is american is fat yes dr Fuller, that is probably true he did look big to his fat his liver looked like it was a little bit fatty so that kind of wraps up the questions and this week it was a little a little bit shorter for me personally i'm slightly less to say i guess about cardiogenic shock but does anybody have anything they want to talk about or questions they'd like to ask or patients that they've had recently with cardiogenic shock that are really interesting. Thanks, Claudia. That was a great lecture. I think cardiogenic shock is one of the hardest topics we cover, in particular, decompensated cardiogenic shock. These are the patients I think I fear the most in the emergency department because they're, they're really difficult to manage. So if anyone has any tips on managing these really, really sick patients, I'd love to hear it. Yeah, I agree. I've listened to um, MRAPs on this and multiple topics because I have a hard time with the balancing of things. I've, you know, I, people much smarter than me have heard talk about balancing, giving medications that we traditionally use to lower a patient's blood pressure. And they're using them at the same time as pressors and doing all these things at the same time. And it's a 
fine line and the mortality rates are really high with these patients because they are so hard to manage. And, and the reality is you're fighting somebody that's had longstanding heart disease usually. Um, so they're just sick to begin with and don't have a lot of reserve. Do you, at your facilities in Vietnam, do you guys have, um, are you dealing with these patients for a long time in the emergency department or do you often see that they go get to the cardiac catheterization or with your cardiology team where they're getting balloon pumps or more advanced procedures pretty quickly? Yeah. Um, in our department, UMC, we receive many patients with heart failure. Mm -hmm. with uh, a septic shock and pneumonia. And uh, Dr. Mark uh, uh, have us to, uh, uh, to uh, 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 emergency ultrasound uh, and to determine to the, dia uh, the diameter of IVC. And um, we, when we see uh, the image of IVC, uh, we we think uh, the patient need uh, more fluid. Thanks, Doctor Mark. <laughs> Doctor Mark. Of course, Doctor. Of course, Doctor How. <laughs> I'm always happy to help you, but Great. I did not yes. teach you. You you taught me. You're the good yeah, ones no. at ultrasound. <laughs> no, crazy. Because uh, in the bus uh, before uh, Doctor Mark coming, uh, we we don't usually uh, use ultrasound machine to evaluate the patient in emergency department. Mm -hmm. But now in our department, we have a, a ultrasound machine. So in a, a difficult situation, uh, we need to use uh, ultrasound to determine to, uh, the, the right situation for the patient. And after that, we use the right medicine for, for them. Yeah, that's great. The ultrasound is so helpful right. in these. Yeah, the, it's so great. And the ultrasound is so helpful in these patients yes. when you can use yeah. it and looking at that IDC. And and then if you can get proficient at looking at the echo, you can sometimes yes. even identify those disease processes. I'm definitely learning all the time, especially with my cardiac ultrasound. And, you know, for us in America, cardiac ultrasound can be really hard on these patients because a lot of them are really fat, yeah. <laughs> they're very overweight. And so it's really hard to get a good ultrasound. But if you're, yes. I've, I've seen people that are good at ultrasound be able to get them, but I can't always on somebody that's very large. Yes. Um, great, yeah, lesson any... great lesson and great question today. Yeah. <laughs> oh, thanks. Yeah. Go ahead, Dr. Fan. Are you? Uh, hello, Dr. Claudia. Hi. I, my name is Dr. Ying from UMC. I have two questions today. Uh, firstly, is it that a uh, beta blocker is completely contraindicated in acute heart failure? The first one, and how about your opinion? Yeah, I typically don't, I mean, I, there are some, like if you talk with your cardiology team, there are some instances where that with cardiogenic shock or heart failure, where they'll recommend a beta blocker or, or something to slow the heart down. You know, if somebody's in, if they are in heart failure because of an arrhythmia and you really think that the arrhythmia is what's contributing to their heart failure, then you can sometimes give a beta blocker. I generally would do that with the cardiologists in mind or like talking to them because the beta blockers can also really, they can take away the heart's ability to contract. So you have somebody that's just barely hanging on and you give them a beta blocker. Sometimes then the heart function or the pump function of the heart just sort of deteriorates and stops working as well. But I've had instances working with cardiology where I've given it, especially if the patient has a major arrhythmia. Um, in those cases with arrhythmia too, you can try to use other, other agents as opposed to a beta blocker to do it. But I've used it on occasion, just in the right patient. I'm not gonna use it as any kind of first line medication, just since I, you know, some, I don't, 
a lot of times it's better to have the patient be a little bit tachycardic than to take away their underlying ability, their heart's underlying ability to pump or function. So yes, yeah, so it should be caution. Just uh, in some case that uh, reduce the contract stability, right? But uh, because yeah. that uh, just yesterday the cardiologist uh, tell me to put um, uh, beta blocker in the patient with acute heart failure. Mm -hmm. Her NT BNB is about uh, fourteen thousand. Wow. Um, what yeah. did they have a? Was that yeah. rate abnormal or what was there, or was it just for blood pressure management? What did you give it for? Well, yeah, if he, uh, she has the, uh, it's a sign of rhythm, but, um, but some uh, ectopic, mm -hmm. ectopic, uh, yeah. And she has uh, like, um, her, when I when I do the ultrasound at bed, uh, I think that her contractibility is still good, like the EF is, still about uh, 50, oh, 55 oh, still about oh, 55 good so, yes I'm, i will uh um will be careful but um, i follow them and keep uh, yeah as a <laughs> i know I, I usually would rely on cardiology because it's going to be their patient <laughs> once they leave the emergency department so i don't really argue with them very often that's i'm impressed you can tell how what you could get an ultrasound to see what the EF was because like the ejection fraction. Well, I guess <laughs> actually I, uh, I don't make any measurement, but just look. Mm -hmm. And the, the second question is that I think it's really hard in some uh, case that the uh, uh, cardiogenic shock because of venvula, venvula, uh, acute venvula disease, like uh, the, mm, the mitral or regard Mm -hmm. uh, in, in that time, we have to do the Doppler, do the Doppler um, cardiac ultrasound, mm -hmm. right? Uh, be, because we, we are emergency physicians, so we are not familiar with the Doppler. So it's really hard for us in that situation. Um, well, can you share some experience in when we use the Doppler on, um, in in some, in that case, what do you think? And and some about the con. Uh, I think the uh, another reason is that in some disease that uh, have the content of malformation, we have to use the Doppler ultrasound too. So, um, can you share your experience? Yeah, I'm not. I I wish I was better at ultrasound. I'm not gonna. I'm not an ultrasound expert. I'm not. I like for a valvular rupture, I can look and look at the valves and see if anything looks like it's not hitting the other side of the wall. So that might show you if you can look at your different valves or get good pictures of the valves. For me, valvular rupture becomes something that I diagnose or I'm suspicious of more by history. So the patient's history, if they've had a recent heart attack is a really big red flag. And then they all of a sudden get sudden chest pain and then their symptoms come on very rapidly. So that's a big difference with a valve rupture is their symptoms come on very abruptly. If it's not a valve rupture, if it's like a mitral regurgitation or aortic stenosis or one of those, you know, look, listening for murmurs. So for me, again, it's history, listening for murmurs talking to them about what their symptoms have been. So if they're having increasing exertional dyspnea, if they're getting lightheaded with standing, if um, they're not able to perform like their regular tasks. So I just look at history for those, those disease processes. Personally, I'm not great at echo. If I have really high suspicion, I hear somebody with a new murmur, I usually try to get a formal echo or try to get somebody that can look at the heart a little better than I personally can. Um, so that's my experience with that. Same with congenital malformation. That is, I can, that's over what my knowledge. It's really hard. Pediatric cardiac ultrasounds. I don't know if you've done them, but they're really hard. They're hard for me because the heart rate is usually in a newborn or in somebody really young, the heart rate's so fast that it, it becomes difficult to actually look at what's going on with the heart. And then also knowing, you know, if, if you're talking about cardiogenic shock in a pediatric patient, knowing what's normal, what's not, their 
PFOs, things like that. That's also really tricky and something I'm not an expert at. Um, and so those are all really good questions and I'll be, I'll, I would love to know more and I'd love to be more proficient at looking at all of that with ultrasound, but I'm just not, I, I, I leave those ones to the people that are trained in it and much better than me. Maybe Dr. Fuller can shine light on, I mean, do you, can you get ultrasounds? Are you good at getting ultrasounds for looking at valve stuff like a mitral regurgitation or aortic stenosis? Or, I think those are great questions. And I think I do too. You know, cardiac but, ultrasound is one of these things that I, um, I think has a lot of utility in the emergency department, but I struggle with where to draw the line between efficiency and, and, and uh, utility of doing the study. I think one thing I will say with caution with, with valve evaluation in the emergency department is you should never rule out a valve problem if you have a high suspicion, even if you don't see it on ultrasound. But you can confirm a valvular issue if you see it on your ultrasound and know what you're looking at. And that's not a very good answer, but at the same time, for those people who are familiar enough with ultrasound and you can see a valvular problem, uh, use it to confirm your diagnosis. But don't mm -hmm. ever say, because I don't see something here, I'm ruling it out or I'm eliminating it as a potential cause without a formal echocardiogram. Does that make sense? And I think if you spend too much time yourself trying to look for it, you really may, uh, you may disadvantage all the other patients in the emergency department you're trying to take care of at the same time. And so you can't become so solely focused on this one patient that you lose sight of all the other patients and you're doing an ultrasound for 30 or 45 minutes. That's really not the way to use ultrasound in the emergency department. It's to quickly evaluate for something that you are suspicious of, like using the rush exam or doing a quick bedside echo to see if uh, a valve uh, is, is not working or there is a pericardial effusion or a ventricular wall has an, a wall motion abnormality. It's yeah. not to spend 30 to 45 minutes evaluating somebody's heart. Yes, I totally agree with Matt because it will yeah. help to receive and follow many and many is patient. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have to uh, quickly evaluate patient and after that we give us some medicine for them and we have to focus on another patient. I totally agree with you, Matt. Craig. This is why you are a very smart doctor, Dr. Howe. <laughs> <laughs> I follow you. I always follow you. <laughs> we and learn from Craig. each other, my friend. We learn from <laughs> each <my> other. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's a great point. Oh, well, thank, thanks a lot for your yeah. Your... Yeah, thank you. I'm Dr. Claudia. I'm Dr. Dean from uh, Charai Hospital. Hi. Uh, I have a question for you. Yeah. Uh, if a patient come with uh, pneumonia, edema, and uh, with a high blood pressure, but the patient is uh, drowsy, uh, she's not awake. So uh, you would, uh, what we choose uh, intubate the patient immediately or uh, we, uh, uh, we try to uh, use medication first? Um, so you, let me just try to summarize. So you said the patient has pneumonia and they're hypotensive, their blood pressure is low. Yes. And they're drowsy? Yeah. Yes. Okay, so pneumonia, low pressure, and drowsy, and then use medication first or just intubate the patient first? Does that wrap up the question? I just want to make sure I'm answering what you said. I think so. So in a patient that comes in that's altered but has pneumonia, so they're in and in septic shock, it's really I'm tough. Not well, go ahead. Uh, pulmonary uh, edema. I'm sorry. Oh, and, and pulmonary edema too, on top of it all. There's a sick not, patient. Not, not, pneumonia, not pneumonia. Oh, okay. Just pulmonary edema. Yes. Yeah. So in those, in a patient that has, that is altered with pulmonary edema, 
I usually try to just go for the intubation. Now, that being said, this is somebody that while you're getting started, if they're too altered that you think BiPAP or CPAP wouldn't work, then you're just going to bypass that and go to intubation. You do want to try to do whatever you can to improve their blood pressure before you intubate them. Because remember during intubation, if you're giving any medications or even just the process of intubation can decrease somebody's sympathetic tone. So any ability they have to just maintain that blood pressure, their heart rate, you can completely take that away by intubating them. So you may end up with a patient that's crashing and you eventually lose pulses. So in these patients, this is, those are patients I I will sometimes use push dose pressors. So push dose of epinephrine. So you can use Um, like a code epinephrine, you mix it with some saline and give a little bit of pressors. So you give some medication to improve that blood pressure enough so they can tolerate any medications or the procedure itself of intubation. And then I probably would intubate them because you're just going to have, otherwise you're going to have difficulty doing anything successfully on the patient. These patients with heart failure, that are hypotensive are so hard to treat. You can't just give them nitroglycerin. You can't, you know, you can't give them Lasix very easily. You can't give them diuretics easily. So in these patients, I would intubate them because that's the most immediate thing that's going to kill them is that respiratory depression that also allows you to buy some time, give them sonorepinephrine, possibly give them dobutamine. And the intubation can sometimes improve that pulmonary edema because you're giving oxygen to the alveoli that opens them up. It allows for better, um, it allows you to have better blood flow, or you're going to get better exchange of gas exchange and kind of get rid of that fluid more easily. So I probably would intubate those patients before I do much else as I'm getting ready to intubate, giving a small amount of uh, pressors like epinephrine to help their blood pressure just so they don't arrest during the intubation. Thank you. Yeah, Yeah, thank you. That was a good question. In in our department, uh, sometimes pulmonary edema, we use uh, morphine for the patient. How do you think about that? In for morphine for the patients? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pulmonary edema. yeah, for patients with pulmonary edema. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't see any reason not to. I think sometimes that just having a patient, if they are having difficulty breathing or they're anxious, giving them something that can help just relax them a little bit. A lot of times in these patients, it's really helpful, um, especially if you're going to put them on CPAP or BiPAP. Um, I really, I oftentimes like to give them a little something to make them more comfortable and morphine's good for that as well, because I mean, you have to be a little careful if their blood pressure is really low, because even that morphine can lower their blood pressure. But for the most part, I think it's okay to give a little bit of morphine and make the patient comfortable. Because I mean, I, have you ever put a CPAP on? Have you guys ever tried that? Because I've put a, somebody had me try it where you put the CPAP or the BiPAP on your face and it's awful. Yeah. You yeah. feel like you're suffocating. And after that experience, I, since then, I've always tried to give whatever I feel the patient can tolerate. I get, I always yeah. give them a yeah, little yeah. something because Some it's not comfortable. Can't stand the, when, uh, when the doctor give them BiPAP. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of times ketamine is another medication that can be used in these cases. I don't know if you guys use ketamine regularly, but you can give a small dose of ketamine um, to these patients because the ketamine does have potential, you know, in asthmatics, we use it here for BiPAP or CPAP, but it can work in these patients as well. It's just hard if they're already tachycardic, that can be a secondary effect of the ketamine but another choice, but morphine's great for this. Uh, any other questions? Uh, yes, I have another question. Um, okay. Well, uh, what, uh, how do you think about we uh, combine the 
who um, come by the full smile in a cardiogenic stroke patient uh, because I do have a I did have a patient that uh, he is a young male patient with cardiogenic stroke. Uh, I, at first when when he come to us, I um, I give uh, him fluid, but then when I get the ultrasound and do the cardiac ultrasound, I stop it because it's like he has a dilated cardiomyopathy and the EF is only just uh, 15 or 20 percent uh, like um, so that I I gave him norepinephrine but then uh, when I invited the cardiologist uh, he he tell me to give him double vitamin it's okay and then for us my, because he has the peripheral edema. Um, where in, in that patient that um, I think it's still okay to give furosemide in a cardiogenic shock patient. Is it um, okay? How do you think about that? Yeah, I, I definitely think so. You know, some of those questions were weird out there. I don't, yeah, don't get the impression because that question, it just didn't want you to give furosemide first, but for cardiogenic shock furosemide is is helpful, especially you're giving them dobutamine at the same time. So you're giving a medicine that can help with their blood pressure a little bit. So you're not as worried about that. And the furosemide is great because it's just going to eventually get that fluid out of the extra, extra spaces. So out of the lungs, out of the legs, you know, obviously we worry more about the lungs, but getting that fluid out of the lungs. So think that's absolutely right to give furosemide, even in cardiogenic shock. And the furosemide is going to have pretty minimal effects on them. It can, but it's got pretty minimal effects on, on that blood, blood pressure. So it sounds like everything, you did everything right. I mean, a young man, I would have given fluids first, absolutely as well. Not because who, who would have thought that he would have dilated cardiomyopathy and all those things, you know, with low blood pressure. So I think it sounds like you did it exactly how most of us would have done it. Yeah, uh, thank you. And in, in some situation, that patient is really like, his defense is up uh, fluid inside a vessel, but he is uh, like um, very full mm -hmm. in edema. So how can uh, treat with that patient because of the, the myocardiopathy. So, but he is still like I think that he the the IVC is still collapsed. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. how do we treat with that patient? Do we give him more fluid because he is still like a, there's in inside the vessel, but outside the peripheral is mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean you can like if you with cardiology, and I've definitely seen nephrology do it where they're giving fluids at the same time as they give Lasix to try to improve, um, to try to improve that. Sometimes with these patients, what happens too is I don't know what his cause of dilated cardiomyopathy is, but sometimes the uh, for that disease process, uh, like if they're an alcoholic or they have liver disease along with it, they're really protein malnourished. So their protein is low, their albumin is low. So they don't have the oncotic pressure. They don't have enough protein or oncotic pressure to keep fluid in the vessels. So any fluid that you give them is going to leak out because of their protein malnutrition, um, because of their other disease processes that are going on. So in these patients, sometimes what you can do is you can, you can give albumin. It's really temporizing, but the albumin allows the fluid. It kind of helps the fluid stay in the vasculature itself as opposed to just leaking from those vessels. So sometimes that's that's something you can try. Thank you, Dr. Claudia. Yeah. Great session, Claudia. Thanks so much. Yeah, of course. And any I'll add one more to any anything else, guys? It looks like we answered the question. So um, next week we are going to talk about hemorrhagic shock. And I think looking at your schedule, you guys just did trauma. So there's probably going to be quite a bit of overlap, but we'll try to just focus it.